Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, Tseka. Good morning, Nina. Good morning, Ahuna. Good morning, Sib. Dr. Sib. Good morning, Vanessa. Good morning, Annette. Good morning, Karina. Top of the morning to everyone. I hope you are well. <laughs> You're getting into the worship. Awesome. Don't worry. Worship continues. Worship continues in Jesus' name. The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Welcome to day, I'm already forgetting what day it is. Is this day four? Yeah, day four of our fasting unto the Lord by the grace of God. The Lord is so good. How you doing out there? How you doing? How you doing? Are you face are you facing God? <laughs> I was going to say, are you facing yourself? And I remembered we learned that we are meant to face God. Whatever you face, whatever you face is what you will reflect. Man was created to image, to um, mirror. So whatever you face is what you will reflect, right? So are you facing God? Are you turning slowly? What are you facing? Are you facing culture? Are you, are you even facing issues? Or are you facing God? I hope you are um, facing the Lord in this fast. No, my voice is doing this morning, <laughs> but all is well to the glory of God. Um, are you being humbled at this point? I'm definitely getting to the point where I'm a lot more. Hmm. <laughs> I'm a lot quieter. Um, how you how you doing? I, I hope I do hope you are not just abstaining from food, but you are fellowshipping with God, meditating on God, talking to the Lord, allowing Him to forensic you, not to search you. Search you is one level. This one you want Him to forensic you. Lord, forensic me. That's a whole prayer point. Search me, O oh God. And know my heart and see if there be any wicked way in me. Um, so yes, good. Tasega said she's good, thank God. And she had a refreshing time with our Lord yesterday. Awesome. Awesome. There's a moment um, last year's content. I don't know if the people that were at last year's content um, would remember. We got to a point where it was just still. Like... It wasn't, I don't know how to explain it or express it, but there was just a stillness in everyone in the room. The presence of God was sat with, yeah, okay, Grace, remember, the presence of God sat with us and we were just still. Like, I knew what it is to for everyone to be still. It wasn't a thing where it was, Anyone was like, let's be quiet in the presence of God. There was just a stillness in the room. Um, and I I do pray, because we, if, I don't know if you know yet, we've started content. <laughs> we've started content, the conference already, so to speak. Um, the whole aim of the gathering together is to camp with God, is to camp with God, is to camp with God. The whole aim when God moved content from a one day, people of God, I don't think the team get it. We went from a one day worship and intercession <laughs> to a four nights, five days uh, program because the Lord said, bring the people to camp with me bring the people to camp with me bring the people to me and so one of the things we do with the retreat is that we let people know that we are camping with the lord and uh the first year covid hit so we had to do a staycation with the lord and we did that for two years and yesterday no yesterday last year by the grace of god we did it in person and God really did honor his word where we camped with God, where we 
pulled away from our day-to-day -day lives and we were able to sit with God. And it was an incredible encounter with the Lord. Um, I called it a retreat um, because that's what I thought it was. But as you can see this year, we have renamed it because apparently we um, did not market it right as people thought a retreat would be we'd come and we would i don't know i, I don't know what people thought we would just be resting maybe we would do facials so i don't know what it was so uh, but at the end <laughs> we were told that we should call it the boot camp because you come and you're not it's, if you're gonna sleep sleep at home you've been sleeping all your life and drink kind of um so we come and we we face god <laughs> we face god we face god we face god uh, genesis chapter 32 is the scripture for content i'm saying this in case you want to put your name down on the waiting list for next year genesis 32 it says from verse one as jacob started on his way again angels of god came to meet him and when Jacob saw them, he exclaimed, this is God's camp. So he named the place Mahanaim. This is God's camp. And he named the place Mahanaim, which means the camp of God. But God wants to sit with us. You know, when you read the book of Revelation, it talks about how the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven. And it says that the dwelling of God is among the people. Now, we don't have to wait for that to happen by the grace of God. As a child of God, the Bible lets you know that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost and his spirit dwells with you. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple. You see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 16 to 17, and 1 Corinthians chapter 6, from verse 19 to 20. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God wants to dwell in you. God wants you, God wants to dwell in you. You know, Jesus letting the the his followers know. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 Brasotai. About the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14. I'm always amazed at God and how he speaks a word so timely. I left yesterday wondering why I was telling you about making sure you do not ignore the Holy Spirit and some of the dreams or the visions it gives you and making sure you pray. And afterwards, one of my, one of my babies, my sisters, my, my yes, um, sent me a message that she had had a dream and that dream was problematic. Do you want to say the least about someone being murdered? And I realized that the admonition, even though I saw what I saw with regards to that young lady, the, the woman and her son, the exposition of that, the expounding of that was because she also needed to hear what to do with the dream she had. And I hope she was able to pray and intercede. I love Jesus. I hope you love Jesus. I hope you love Jesus. I hope you love Jesus. And I do pray that if God ever puts you on anybody's heart, that they actually pray too, because some people be out here be like, you were on my heart. Yeah. So what did you do with me on your heart? I just thought to call me before you call me, call Jesus. You should have, let people know if God ever puts me on your heart before you call me, call Jesus. Okay, speak to Jesus. 
when you speak to Jesus, then you can call me. And then perhaps after speaking to me, you can then find out some more things to pray about. Very important. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And we'll go from verse 15. If you love me, if you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him, but you know him because he lives with you and later on be in you. I'm reading the NLT and later on will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as often as I will come to you. Hmm. Prior to the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, prior even to our Lord and Savior being incarnated into human form because we know that he existed before the New Testament, he is eternal. He has no beginning or no end. Before Abraham was, I am, Jesus says. He is part of the Trinity, the Father, he is the Son, and of course we have the Holy Spirit. Prior to the coming of Jesus in human form in the New Testament, because we see in the Old Testament that God has come to the earth previously. We see him show up with uh, Abraham in Genesis chapter 18 in bodily form, praise Jesus. We see him show up with Joshua. We see him show up. How many of you have noticed that, that the person of Jesus is not the first time God has come on the earth? Am I messing up your theology? Okay, fantastic. It's the first time he came as a baby and to live among us in human form, but it wasn't the first time. You have, how did I forget? You have the high priest, Melchizedek, who had no father, no mother, no beginning, no end. But prior, even then, Prior to that, the Holy Spirit has always been also, he's also eternal, the Holy Spirit. You see the work of the Holy Spirit in Genesis chapter one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then the earth was without form and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the darkness, hello? So the spirit of God, you see him at the very beginning, Genesis. You see him involved in creation. Let us make man. We call our God, Elohim, Yahweh. We call him the God who is us. He, the God who is us. So the one God who is us. One God, three persons. So we see Elohim, the, the strong one. The word Elohim also shows us that there is three, there is, there is mult multiple, not just one, but he's one God in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see the workings of the Spirit of God through scripture, all through the Old Testament. Even when you get down to the law, you see the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God come upon individuals to enable them, to equip them. You see the Holy Spirit at work with the prophets. You see the Holy Spirit at work. So the Holy Spirit being with people was not distinctive. What distinguishes us, even the Spirit of God upon my God is not distinct. What distinguishes us in receive, are you guys following me? Let me make sure, are you with me? Check in, are you with me? 
good stuff. It's 5 a.m. It's just past five, so I want to make sure you're with me. What distinguishes us is the fact that the Spirit of God now lives in us. Remember, in Genesis chapter 2, in Genesis chapter 2, we read Genesis chapter 1, we made man in his, God made man in his image and likeness. We, we looked at that. What does that mean, image and likeness? We're meant to image God, mirror God. Also, we know God is a three-part being. He's, he's three in one, so he is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three in one. You and I are also three in one. Let me know you're tracking with me. I know you know this. How are we also three in one? Show me. Write it in the write it in the comments. How is man? How are we three in one? Show me. Show me. Come on. If I pastor you, you better get there quickly. There you go. <laughs> to me. <laughs> All right. Spirit, soul, and body. Fantastic. Yes. Well done. Spirit, soul, and body. Fantastic. We are spirit, so we are three in one. Absolutely. And how did we get there? In the beginning, after he created everything, on day six, he says, let us make man our image after our likeness and let him have dominion. We looked at a little bit at that uh, yesterday, a little bit. <laughs> If you study that word image, my God, it's me. Uh, if I remember the Hebrew word teslem, T-S-E-L-M. And part of the definition is create as a phantom. When I first read that phantom, I thought, what? We are phantoms? And I was like, no, remember God is spirit. So when God says, God created man in my image. It's in the, so God made man in, it, in, the, in his image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. The first thing you, you need to remember is God created man, mankind, not gender. He created man. Man is spirit. Man is spirit. God created man. And then you read in Genesis chapter 2. Don't worry, I'm, I'm going to connect it with what we're saying before. Genesis chapter 2 verse six the no verse four the bible says when the lord god made the earth and the heavens neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth for the lord had not yet sent rain to water the earth and there were no people to cultivate the soil instead springs came up from the ground and watered the land then the lord god formed man first time we read is he created man second time the second account we're reading about the same process is giving us a little more insight Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 the Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth so that's your physical body it says that's why scientists may say oh well humans have similarities to animals and they they say that they are related to animals are you related to animals um, and you can see because God formed your encasement. God formed your encasement. The Bible says from the dust of the ground. But the encasement, though lovely to look at, was not mobile, was not alive. That's why, I don't know if you've ever seen a dead body. Once the spirit and the soul depart, you have the body left for a while, but a formed body is not alive. The evidence of a physical body is not the evidence of life. He formed man out of the dust of the ground. However, it was when he breathe the breath of life 
into man. It's when he breathed the breath of life into man, the Bible says, into man's nostrils, that the man became a living person. That the man became a living person. What causes you and I to come alive is the breath of God, the breath of God, the breath of God, or the breath of life. He breathed and then the man became a living person or a living soul. So the, God put his spirit into man and the mixture of the, what happens when the spirit went into man is man not just became a body, became a living soul. What makes you alive, what makes your soul alive is the breath of God on the inside of you. That's why when I read scripture, that says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I realized this. While every human being has breath, ability to breathe, our respiration while you're alive, your respiratory system goes. After the fall of man and the perversion of the image of God in man, the system of breathing continued, but the breath of the Almighty that gives life, that gives real life, gives true life, the Holy Spirit, the Ruah of God. Not everybody has that. You see, in John, are you in John? The Bible says, Jesus breathed in John chapter 20, verse 19. Are you tracking with me? John 20, verse 19, the word of the Lord says, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them. What did Jesus do? What did God, he was involved, do in the beginning after he formed man? The Bible says he breathed, he breathed, he breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils and man became a living soul. Outside of God, we see them as dead. Whoever is not in Christ, the Bible says you were once dead in your trespasses. Your definition of death maybe a cessation from uh, um, existing. But God sees anyone, according to scripture, that is not in him, anyone that is not born again, that has not received him. That's why you've got to be born again, because after the fall of man, man moved from being a living soul to being a dead soul. So in order to come alive again, in order to come alive, you must receive God. And what happens when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior is that he comes in, the Spirit of God comes in. That's why you have to be born of water and spirit and you come alive again. If you're with me and you're, gra you're, you're, you're grateful that you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, would you type in the comments, come alive? Come alive, come alive, come alive, come alive, <laughs> come alive. Hey, ama sata lebe ke shete libra donai. Irra ba 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 ko surre be be ki darra maso da libra donshka. Come alive, come alive, come alive. In Ephesians chapter two. The Bible says in verse one, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, 
you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, you see? So death for God is not just physically being, not breathing. So when we say let everything that has breath praise the Lord, yes, we're commanding everyone to praise God because everyone should praise God. But you got to know that only people that have the breath of the Almighty, the 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 ruach of God, uh, <laughs> uh, only those that have Him are able to praise God. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit that is at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way. It's funny. He says you were dead, but says you live because there is there is dead and there is dead. There is some, ooh, some people that are dead to people are more alive than them. I don't know if you get it. Some people that are that they've finished their race on this side of eternity, that are to the world dead, are more alive because they died in faith, they died in God, they live ever before the presence of God. Some people are literally just dead men walking. I remember saying to some, I was, um, was it? Yeah, I was coordinating a funeral <clears throat> of a young lady. Oh, it was painful. My God, it's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. But God's grace is sufficient. And I remember saying to them, who were grieving, rightfully so. I'm not one of those people that say don't grieve. People that part no grieve. There's this place, there's space in God to grieve. Just grieve right the right way. I said, it would be tragic if you lose faith in God because she died in God. Like it would be, some people are like, oh, this person died. And you want to lose your faith because, and that person is with the Lord. They're alive. Even when he speaks about those that, are, the, the Bible tells us that God is the God of the living and not of the dead. So he calls, he talks about, scripture talks about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as if they still are alive are you with me because in god if you the the evidence of you of you being alive is not just you being alive on the earth you could be alive on the earth they may take your vital uh your vitals and you you're registering alive in the hospital but you in heaven you're registering dead may you not register as dead in jesus name may you not register as dead in jesus name <laughs> Ay, 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 ay. Man to but then the Bible says this. In verse 3 says, all of us used to live that way following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone, what el everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead, because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by grace that you have been saved for God, for he has raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly place, heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in our future ages as examples of his incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all that he has done for us who are united with Christ. The New King James Version put it like this in verse four, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. He made us alive. So scripture tells us that you were, according to scripture, in the eyes of God, you and I were dead. When did that death come into man? It was in Genesis chapter 3. When man turned away from God and obeyed Satan. When man, by man I mean Adam and Eve, mankind. Remember scripture says, in the beginning God created heaven and earth and then he says this 
let us make man in our own image in the image of and then it says in the image of god he created him male and female man was created first and then man was made into male or female man was created first we know that adam in, in one and then god you know what it says god looked at man it's like it's not good for man to be alone all in one and so god put adam the man to sleep and he extracted woman from man so male and female is man but god takes out of the first man and creates woman but adam and eve male and female were both in the image of god both in the first man are you with me are you with me and so spirit of god that in john chapter 20 that we read after his resurrection he says receive the holy spirit what you see in acts chapter 2 is not them receiving the holy spirit for the first time it is them receiving the empowerment of the spirit of god in order for them to be witnesses john chapter 20 when people ask me is it possible For someone to be born again and not be empowered by the Spirit of God and not be, you know, I say, you know what? Being born again and being empowered by the Spirit of God can happen simultaneously. But for some people, it doesn't. John chapter 20, verse 22, he breathed, he breathed on them, the breath of God. He breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit, John 20, 22. In Acts chapter 1, they had already received the Holy Spirit. But he says to them in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 5. That they will receive the Holy Ghost not many days from now. Sorry, not receive. They will be baptized. Get my, it's very important to get those words right. Acts chapter 1, verse 5. For John truly baptized with water. The word baptize, baptizo means to be immersed. John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized, immersed with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. There's a difference between receiving and being baptized. The Bible tells us when Jesus was baptized by John that mm -hmm, the heavens opened and the Spirit of God rested upon him identifying him as a son of God. I like what you're trying to say. Mm. The spirit of God told John, God told John, the one you see my spirit rest upon, he's the one. So he's able to be identified as the son of God. John chapter one tells us that as many as receive him, John chapter one, Verse 12, as many as received him, to them he gave the right, the power to become sons of God, those who believe on his name. So when you come into Christ and you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you receive him. You receive the spirit of adoption, according to Romans chapter 8. So you can now call him Abba Father. But receiving him for sonship, 
is not going to be enough for you to manifest his power to be a witness because even Jesus even Jesus the Bible says after he was baptized in water and the Spirit of God came upon him he was driven into the wilderness for 40 days for 40 days and the Bible says that when he returned do you remember when he returned he returned in the power of the Holy Ghost. He returned in the power of the Holy Ghost. Let me see. I think that's Luke's account. Luke chapter 4, verse 14. The word of the Lord says, Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. Baptism of the Holy Spirit brings you into the power of the Holy Spirit. How do I know that you can have received God without receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit? The Bible says in Acts chapter 19, for those of you that are writing the scriptures, I'm sorry I can't send it to you before because I'm also hearing them at the same time as you're hearing them. Okay. Acts chapter 19, the Bible says in verse 1, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, he found some disciples. A disciple is those that are following God. He found disciples, that means they believe and they are following. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into then were you baptized, into John's baptism. Ah, Paul says, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people, that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now, they were all about 12. They were about 12 in number. After they, they were disciples already, but they only knew up to the revelation that Apollos had taught them, which is the baptism of John, which is the baptism of repentance. So he had called them to repent. But repentance is a gateway. The repentance is a door. It's to bring you into reconciliation with Abba. Now, after they had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, remember John himself said, there is someone coming after me that is greater than me, who's sandal who's the latch of his sandals i'm not worthy to touch and he says this i baptize you in water but he will baptize you with the holy ghost and fire the baptism of the holy ghost the immersing of us in is what brings us into the power dimension to be able to function in our new authority are you with me and so why am I saying this to you? Man is a three-part being. The part of us that engages with Abba, three-part being, let me give you evidence of the three-part being. Second Thessalonians, I don't know if I quoted it before. Second Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. May God sanctify you wholly. Holy. I'm talking about W-H-O-L-L-Y. And then it says, spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. The spirit and the soul make up your inner man. Your body is your encasement. Now, God cares about all three parts of you. In fact, he would let you know that you've been bought with a price. And so he says, you should glorify God in your body. But I want us, as we're looking at being those that image God, image bearers of God, 
to first start, and we started yesterday praying for our heart. The heart is used um, interchangeably to mean your spirit, your inner man. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it tells you the, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it tells you that it's able to divide. It divides between spirit and soul. It divides between soul and spirit. It lets you know what is from your, your soul, with your soul. Um, should we do this today? Okay, let's do spirit. Your spirit also has three functions. Your spirit man, you have a spirit. It is with your spirit man that you're able to connect with things that don't have physical bodies. You're able to connect with the things, spiritual things. Hello, hi. Okay, let me put people on the spot because, I mean, if I mentor your pastor, you should know this. What are the three functions of the spirit of man? The spirit of man is different from the spirit of God. But the spirit of man is the is the house of God in the sense that when the spirit of God comes into your temple, your spirit man is where he dwells. His spirit, right? God is spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He's our spirit man. Now, your spirit has three functions. To me, grace, simi, alarke. What are the three functions? Dami. <laughs> there are thea. What are the three functions of our spirit? Good. Communion. Intuition. Come on now. One more. Communion intuition, it starts with a C. It's, should I help you? Your gauge of right or wrong. You're welcome. <laughs> yes. So it's not that your spirit man is divided into three. It is that it has three functions, three functions. Function is communion. It's how you fellowship with God. Well, if you're a Christian and you're born again, your spirit man communes, fellowships with God. If you're not a believer, you still have a spirit. It's just, it's dead. And that means you're able to commune with still come in with spirits but not the spirit of god how many of you know that god is not the only spirit the spiritual realm the spiritual world is not just the holy spirit you've got angelic beings you have demonic beings and so the where your where your spirit is turned to will determine what spirit <laughs> you pick up. Don't be deceived to think that just because someone is not born again and they are nice means that, you know, they don't have a spirit behind it. Man is created to image. Regardless of how nice someone is, the spirit in them, this, there is always a spirit behind someone, spirit influence in them. Uh, remember Jesus looking at the Pharisees and says, you are of your father, the devil. That's a whole thing for you to, to remember. So with the man's spirit, you can commune with the spirit realm. God, of course, wants you to be able to commune with his spirit. Uh, but if you're not born again, you still have your ability to commune, to engage with the spirit world. Even you as, in, as, as a believer, you can pick up and discern other spirits. Like, and, you know, atmosphere changes in your room and 
you're like, nah, that's not the spirit of God. That's that's a that's a strange spirit. But your your ability to pick up, yeah, uh, to pick up spirit is from your spirit, man, because you also are a spirit because you were created to have a spirit. You have spirit, but that you also, um, you have a spirit. Um, so commune uh, in Luke chapter one verse forty seven. It says, my spirit, my spirit rejoices in God. Those uh, John chapter four, those that worship must worship in spirit and in truth. Um, Romans chapter one, verse nine, Apostle Paul says, God, who, whom I serve with my spirit. The different scriptures that lets you know, you know, uh, Romans chapter eight is one of the clearest ones that the Bible says that the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. So there's a difference between your spirit and his spirit, but the spirit of God bears witness with your spirit that you are sons of God. Yes, that's Romans chapter eight, verse 16. Um, First Corinthians six, verse 17 says, whoever is united with the Lord becomes one spirit with him, becomes one spirit with him. Um, First Corinthians chapter 14, um, Apostle Paul tells us the conclusion of the matter in verse 15. He will pray with his understanding. He will also pray with his spirit, with the spirit. He will sing with the understanding. He will also sing in the spirit. Um, your ability to do this is because you also have a spirit. Um, and so one of the functions of your spirit, man, is to commune with God. Remember Apostle Paul praying? He says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship the communion to commune with someone means to spend time to to um fellowship to build relationship with so the communion of the holy spirit and you do that with your spirit man um why am i saying this to you today and we're gonna go through because remember we're mirrors we're supposed to mirror and whoever you behold or whatever you behold you become god is calling us back to our true identity as, as image bearers, to know that when Jesus came, he came to bring you back to life, to bring you back to life by giving you his spirit, his spirit. So now that you are born again, you've been made alive in God. But the thing about our spirit man is if we're not careful, if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we can go back into things that cause deadness to come into us. You want to have a purity of your fellowship with God. The other things that the other functions of the spirit is intuition. Intuition to be a intuition is your ability to know things without anything from the empirical world just know things intuitively that happens with your spirit in mark chapter 2 you see that jesus perceiving in your spirit is your ability to perceive things your discerner in um acts i want to say chapter 16 there's a lady that was following the dis the disciples or the apostles at the time she was saying the right things but the bible says that you know, the Paul was vexed in his spirit. She was saying what was right, but he was vexed in his spirit. There was a knowing in him that although she's saying the right things, she's not right. The, the spirit behind it wasn't right. So she, he was able to rebuke that spirit. And she got, she got delivered from that spirit that caused the whole hoo-ha. So your ability to know things uh, uh, intuitively intuitively you are it's your it's your ability to perceive this is not communion now your ability to perceive things to perceive things to perceive things that comes from your spirit man and of course you have your conscience your conscience is your gauge of what is right and wrong your gauge for what is right or wrong your conscience is your is your discerning organ so to speak to distinguish between right or wrong um 
but not because you've learned it. You know, sometimes you don't know why something is wrong, but you know it's wrong. Anyone ever experienced that? Something just don't feel right. It may look right, but it don't feel right. The person is saying Jesus, but I'm not, sign, signs off. <laughs> um, you're about to do something, but you just know that nobody has to, everybody else says this right, but you know it's, it's wrong. It's your discerner. It's your discerner. Your conscience, the work of the conscience is independent and it's not, it doesn't flow towards external opinions. That's why you have to be ca careful that you don't um, mess up your conscience. If you do things against your conscience, so God, you can shipwreck your faith, according to Apostle Paul to Timothy, if you go against your conscience. You know, your God is through your conscience is telling you to stay away. Don't go here. Don't do this. But you force yourself to do it because you, you can't see anything from a experiential point of view why you shouldn't do why shouldn't i call this person why shouldn't i go here why should I? but your conscience is telling you no if you do it, you go against your conscience and then you begin to teach yourself how to disobey god your intuition is you're able to sense it's it's not um Again, independent from being taught is your ability to know something. I believe this is where you get revelation from. It's knowledge that comes without any help from your mind, your emotions, your will. Knowledge that comes without you having to study. You just, you know it. You, you know. Revelations of God, movements of the Holy Spirit are known through your intuition. And of course, communion is worshiping God. Today, our prayer point, we've been praying, you prayed for your heart, is God, awaken my spirit, man. I, want, I don't want to be asleep <laughs> spiritually. The Bible says, awake, O ye that slumber. Awake, you sleeper. You want to be awake spiritually. You want to be awake in your spirit man awaken to righteousness ephesians chapter 5 verse 14 says awake O sleeper rise from the dead and god will give you life in matthew chapter 25 the parable of the ten virgins all ten of them fell asleep all ten of them woke up but only five of them had oil when we speak about revival revival is to give life to that which previously had life, but is now dying or dead. And I hope you understand the journey today in the word is to first let you know that yes, you're born again, but if you are not careful, you will go from being born again, being alive to either being sleeping, be, um, being sleepy, being asleep spiritually. You know, when you're asleep, and except you go close to someone that is asleep, you may not know that. You may confuse someone that is asleep for someone that's dead. Do you understand that? Because when you're asleep, you're not conscious of your environment. When you're asleep, you're not conscious of the things of God. So some of some people are not dead, but they're asleep. Question for you. Prior to now, you may be alive in God, but were you asleep spiritually? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14, mm, from verse 8, it says, For once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship, no communion with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, 
Arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. Awake you who sleep. Awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead. You know, the Bible tells us that there is the sleep of death. In the book of Psalm 13, consider and hear me, O Lord my God, lighten my eyes. Eyes also represent spirit. Lighten my eyes lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest I sleep the sleep of death. We want to ask God. The Bible says he's able to sanctify you wholly. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Spirit, soul, and body. You want to present your spirit to God and say, God, awaken me. Awaken my spirit. Let me be able to commune with you. Let, me, let my intuition, my conscience be at work in the name of Jesus. I want you to pray. I do get today's focus. That's what we do in the mornings. We come and we set the focus for the day. We haven't prayed that much, but I want to set your focus. You want to come alive in your spirit. It is in your spirit. A spirit man that is alive is what gives life to your soul. But if you're dead in the spirit or if you're asleep in the spirit, then the lights are out. It is through your spirit that light comes. Are you with me? When the light comes into your inner man, then you are illuminated. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter one, he prays that the God of our father from verse 17, the God of our, the God of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, <laughs> spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding. That's the eyes of your spirit, man be enlightened that you may know if you want to know the functions of your spirit your ability this scripture encapsulates it this is not a function of your soul no mary said my soul magnifies the lord this is mary or elizabeth one of them my soul magnifies the lord my spirit prays his name if you want your soul to come into alignment your spirit man has to be in the driving seat your spirit man needs to be awake your spirit man needs to be alive that's how you can walk in the spirit you know the bible says in galatians if you live in the spirit let us also walk by the spirit too many times man has become body soul and spirit but god wants you to be spirit soul and body you and i are not just spirit we're not just soul we're not just body we are all three parts but who is leading matters the 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 when when man fell and was given to its appetite we we put things in the wrong, uh, what's the word, formation, so to speak. It's supposed to be spirit, soul, and body. But when man fell, we were given to our appetite, so man became soulish. The Bible says that the first Adam was a living soul, but the, 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 the last Adam, the last Adam is a life-given spirit. And so my prayer for you today, even as you embark on this fast of recalibrating, of turning your face back to God, of mirroring God, that your spirit man will come alive again in the name of Jesus and the functions of your spirit, your ability to commune with God. Let me tell you, if your communion with God is affected, your eternal life is affected. How do you know you're alive? It's your ability to commune with God. What is eternal life? Eternal life is not just living forever. <laughs> In John chapter 17, Jesus, Jesus describes eternal life. In verse 3, mm, from verse, let's, 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 context, from verse 1, John 17 from verse 1. Jesus spoke these words lifted up his eyes to the father he said father the hour has come glorify your son that your son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him and this is eternal life this is eternal life that they may know you the only true god 
and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That no is not just a, a head knowledge, like I knew God. You know, that knowing is intimacy and that comes from your spirit, man. That comes from God is spirit and those that worship him must worship him in, in spirit and in truth. Hmm. That they may know, that they may know, that they may know, that they may know, <laughs> that they may recognize that they may perceive, that they may know, that they may know, that they may know. God wants you to know him. God wants you to know him. God wants me to know him. To know God the Father, to know God the Son, to know the Holy Spirit. So today, today, this morning, I came to set the pace for your day, for your communion. God, i I want to I wanna be awake in my spirit, man. Help me to awake to righteousness. Help me to awake to you, O oh God. First Corinthians 15, 34. Awake to righteousness and sin not. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. Awake to righteousness. Awake to God. I don't want to be asleep in my spirit. I want to be able to commune with you, oh God. Help my conscience. I don't want to shipwreck my faith because of a seared conscience. I want to come alive in my spirit. I want to be awake spiritually. Revive my spirit, O God. Let my spirit function as you, O God, has called me to function. In the name of the Lord Jesus. These are the prayers I want you to pray throughout the day. Purge my spirit. In the name of Jesus, of every guile, purge my spirit of everything that is not of you. In the name of Jesus, Father, and help me to commune. Let my the functioning of my spirit to commune with you. Let it be revived. Let it be restored in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, my ability to know, my intuition. Let it come alive in the name of Jesus. My conscience. Let my conscience be healed in the name of of the Lord Jesus. Do you get the prayer points for the day? Father, breathe in me the breath of the Almighty that my spirit man will come alive in the name of the Lord Jesus. When it comes to your conscience, you need your conscience. Hey, First Timothy chapter 1 from verse 18. Apostle Paul, I, I feel like, I, have I given you too much this morning? Have I overloaded you? It's okay to tell me yes. So I can pace myself. I was about to give you another scripture. And I was like, oh, is it an overload? Are you good? All right. So I know we haven't prayed much, but you can watch it. And I want you to take the scriptures and be praying. Remember, we don't just come in together in the day, in the morning. We set the pace together in the morning. But you got to make sure you spend time with Abba throughout the day. First Timothy chapter uh, no, this is good food. Amen. Glory to God. First Timothy chapter 1 from verse 18. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. So prophecy, and we stay there, we, we say, oh, you know, uh, wage war with your prophecy. But look at this. It says, having faith. The way you wage war is having faith and a good conscience. That's why you were telling me that yesterday, Abba. He said yesterday night, he was saying to me, if you're fasting, but you're in disobedience, that's a that's an oxymoron. You can't fast away what you should be obeying. In the place you're supposed to be obeying, you're having offense with someone and you're fasting. The right thing to do is to forgive. Why? Because when you're in disobedience, your, your conscience is not good. How can your conscience be good when you're disobeying God? 
It says, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck or have shipwrecked their faith. Don't shipwreck your faith because you're fasting and praying, but you're not obeying. You may have all the prophecies in the world, but if you are living in disobedience, you will shipwreck your faith. It will come to nothing. Do you know what it is to be shipwrecked? It means you don't get to the destination. So prophecy is great, but the word that was preached to them was preached to us, but it did not profit them anything because it wasn't mixed with faith. But even if you believe God, if your conscience is not good, if you're not in right standing before God, you can still shipwreck your faith. What was that you were going to show me about? I missed it just now. Shipwreck your faith. If your conscience is not good, I sorry, Abba, I was talking and I missed that minute. Bring it back to my memory, please. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Verse three, for though we walk in the flesh, do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Obedience is also a weapon of war. If you are in disobedience in any area of your life, you're not going to be able to execute judgment against the enemy. First Timothy chapter four. <sighs> Verse two talks about people whose conscience have been seared by a hot iron. How's your conscience before God? Did you see that in Colossians chapter three? There's so much to say. Colossians chapter three. It says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you are called in the body, in one body, and be thankful. A lot of people are not at peace because their conscience is it's not there. Their conscience is not healthy. So what's the aim? First Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. I'm going to let you go do your own study. But this is to set you up. First, First Timothy chapter one, from verse three, and I'm gonna let you go. It says, as I urge you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than God the edification, which is in the faith. Some people, we like the complexities. We like people to make the faith so complex. And then you end up arguing about things that but this is what I was supposed to say. Now, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk. If you don't love from a pure heart, if you don't have a good conscience, 
and you don't have sincere faith. All your Greek, Hebrew, theology, whatever, is, is not the first Timothy chapter one. And I read from verse three to five to six, but you can really go to seven. So today you're focusing on your, your, on your, on your primary part, not your only part, which is your spirit, man. You're asking God, purify my spirit. Father, <laughs> you know, when he says creating me a clean heart, your heart is also representative of your spirit, man. It's used interchangeably. In Ezekiel 36, 26, a new heart will I give you, a new spirit would I put within you. You're asking the Lord, awake my spirit, man. Purify my spirit, man. Turn my spirit to you, O oh God. Turn my spirit. Let my spirit yield to you. Let me yield to you. I yield my spirit to you. Those are your prayers for today. And as you pray it, I pray that your spirit will begin to mirror the spirit of God in the name of the Lord Jesus. You have communion with him. I pray grace for you today as you seek his face. Your seeking will not be in vain in the name of Jesus. Take time to pray in the spirit. Take time to pray in your understanding. Take time to worship. Take time to repent if the Holy Spirit brings things to you that you need to repent of. The areas that you need to make good, if there's someone you've been fighting with and you need to make good, please make good. Forgive so that you can have a good conscience before God. God bless you. See you tomorrow.